Hello. Um, so we've done chapter 10 and 11 talking about stress and strain. And now we should do... Uh, chapter 12 was torsion. And I'm going to skip over that. Um, it's, it's similar to Hooke's Law, but uh, you're sort of torquing something instead of pulling and pushing on it. And so the there are spring constants, but they are, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I just, I just, I don't want to put you guys through it because it's different numbers. Um, so yes, chapter 13, uh, a lot of this is review because I've been pretty aggressive with my lecture up front, you know, like when we were in person. So I was always sort of talking about this stuff throughout the class. Uh, so yeah, I want you to read 13.1. 13.2 is talking about different types of supports again. Uh, I'm not sure why they felt the need to separate out a link support, but it's basically two hinge joints, so there's only a net force and no moment, and it's the force is only in one direction. Uh, See, fixed support gives you a cantilever beam. So this this is kind of a flashback to chapter three, in some cases. They felt the need to. Uh, well, I I know why they did this. Uh, they're saying a simply supported beam has two supports on each end, and an overhang has two supports with extra beam out from it, and so they have all these different types of cantilevers as well. Oh, that's cool. Is that over constraint? Huh. These are over constraint too. And so they'll point to a chart with formulas and then you'll be able to use the chart. Um I'm not I'm not going to require you guys to do that, but uh yeah, I guess they're going to have formulas for over over constrained problems, which would be handy. Yeah right here. Statically indeterminate. So yeah, you, you have two fixed supports, so that's um, six reactions. So you're not going to solve for six different reactions in any meaningful way by hand without material properties. Oh, maybe, maybe they go that far in. So we've gone over point loads, distributed load, and I skipped over uh, linearly varying load here. Um, and it was back in chapter three, and maybe I should have gone over it then. Um, basically, if you're solving for the reactions and you have a linearly varying load, which looks like, um, see, here's your beam and you have some sort of a uh, ramping load as it approaches one end, then what you're going to do is you're going to say that the total load on this is the area. So, you know, the, the value will be, so force at a point would be like one half base times height. So that's the area of a triangle. And then its location will be one third, you know, this length. You know, so the triangle's length, it'll be located one third over from the, the base. So, you know, I, I should specifically say, you know, if your if your triangle was like this, so this would be your you know base, and this would be your height. Um, so its point center load would be right there, one third base over. So then it would look like boop, like that. OK, 
Okay, so it's just so similarly when you had a distributed load, it was the area of this box, so just base times height. And the height would be like 10 pounds per foot, and the base would be 10 feet. So you'd multiply the two. And so this is a similar idea. And this is called, what, a centroid? So you're finding the centroid of a triangle. Centroid of a rectangle is just in the, in the center. Alright, and it's talking about reactions in 13.4. I think you guys should be pretty familiar with how to solve for reactions on a beam. Let me see if there's anything over constrained. There is not. So really, a lot of that was review to chapter 3, and now 13.5 is where it starts getting interesting. Um, So you're going to consider shear force inside of the beam by making an imaginary cut and asking what forces would be required to keep it uh, static. And you can characterize all of the shear force all the way down 